Thank you, Giuseppe. I'm very pleased and honored to moderate this uh, panel. What I will try to do, I will try to facilitate the discussion with the audience, most of all, uh, especially about questions that they've been raising in the, in the first part of the program. So how to get there, which strategies, which tools, which uh, subjects or actors. Um, and to do that, uh, I asked um, the participant to this, this panel, uh, which I will introduce in a second, to just start breaking the ice, introducing themselves, talking about their relation to, to the word degrowth in their own work. Um, I asked them to be brief and sharp in order to also allow the time for discussion as much as possible. So I would like already to start right away with the first, Mariana Calcagni Gonzalez. Uh, she's a researcher in sociology at the Free University of Berlin and associate researcher at the Food for Justice research group. Um, so um, she's studying food movements in Chile and Germany from a perspective of uh, feminist critique and political ecology. Thank you for being here, uh, Mariana. You can use this microphone, it's much nicer. Than... Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we, well, thank you very much for the invitation um, and thank you for, for being here. I'm very happy to be here. Um, they ask us to kind of prepare what does degrowth mean to us and uh, on a daily basis, on our everyday life. So I thought I could reflect on who am I? And also it's an invitation for you to think about who you are um, and where do we come from? Because in general, when we uh, start thinking about our own positionality, uh, then we discover that we are part of a large network of beings that have sustained our lives, right? And not only human beings, but all, also um, other beings and other forms of life that are sustaining us um, in general. So I would like to start this conversation uh, by bringing these other forms of lives, uh, more than humans are called in academia in general, but uh, I feel that we can all relate to like just water, minerals, uh, the earth, the soil that sustain our lives and allow us to be here today. Um, I'm a I'm Latin woman, I'm migrant, um, I'm feminist, I'm environmental activist, and that has kind of shaped the way I see the world. Uh, we all are shaped by where we come from, so um, I think um, that's something that it's very important for me when I think about degrowth policies. Uh, there's no neutral knowledge. Um, there's no such thing as positive, uh, positivist knowledge. Um, I think we, we all come from a place where, where we have certain experiences that shape the way we see the world. And of course, for me, it has been the case, uh, as for you as well. Um, and I think that's a very powerful um, and important message from the feminist that degrowth uh, should and is incorporating um, in their, also in their political strategy, in the discourses, in the way um, we're thinking about uh, transformations and transitions. Um, so, um, yeah, I, in general, I, I've been working with indigenous women, indigenous people in Latin America, mostly in Chile, but not only. In Guatemala, Salvador, uh, Colombia, some other countries. Um, because I think it's very relevant to shed light and bring, like, give voice to the ones who haven't been heard enough. enough. Um, so that has like I've been trying to to do a small contribution on on yeah bringing the voice of peasant women specifically now I'm doing a PhD on uh, peasant movements uh, that are part of La Via Campesina I'm happy that we are uh, in this panel with farmers and activists um, of uh, food transitions as well. Um, but yeah, the research has allowed me to to see these different. Um, and uh, ways of living that are very, very far away from what we in academia and research uh, do in general. So I try to combine socio-environmental um, perspectives and studies with feminist struggles, um, political ecology, 
Um, all that in my kind of daily base uh, work. Um, and some years ago, we founded the um, a think tank on socio-environmental uh, issues, which is called CASA, Centro de Análisis Socioambiental. And uh, maybe you can have a look at it, because we are also trying to um, develop um, a Latin American perspective on degrowth. So actually, tomorrow we are um, starting our, our third version of the um, of an introductory course on Latin American degrowth. Um, I'm very happy and we all also have a manual that we kind of collect knowledge. It's open, it's free, it's online in Spanish um, for everyone to want to understand um, degrowth from a Latin American perspective. It's not that we are inv inventing the, the wheel, but it's trying to connect messages that are happening in Latin America, combining with uh, European degrowth per perspectives. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you. I introduce also Leonardo van der Berg. Um, he is the initiator of the Dutch Federation of Agroecological uh, Agro Farmers uh, and members of the, member of the coordinating committee of the European Coordination Via Campesina. Welcome, uh, Leonardo. Thank you, Federico. And thank you, everyone, also for being here and for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I really like the introduction of uh, Alessandra. It's, it's great. Uh, I, I will think I will build on uh, that. Um, but, but the question was, what does degrowth mean in your everyday work? And to me, um, I say degrowth means agroecology, right? Because that makes it easier for me also to answer the question, but also because degrowth uh, our agroecology is about moving towards systems uh, that are moving away from systems that exploit people and nature and moving towards systems that are more caring uh, about nature. And this, to me, is also degrowth. Um, and in my everyday work, I support the creation of agroecological practices. I do this through my work with uh, Tukomsburen, and Tukomsburen is a member organization of La Via Campesina. Uh, I also I'm in the coordinating committee of the European Coordination of La Via Campesina, where we also uh, support the creation of agroecological practices. And one of the ways, uh, the most important way in which we do this is through the peasant-to-peasant -peasant, uh, methodology. Right? And this peasant-to-peasant -peasant methodology, it is really about uh, bringing farmers together, uh, having farmers share their experiences, uh, share uh, talk about their struggles, their needs, uh, reflect upon the political context in which they're in, and from there uh, actually start developing new practices, but also developing um, uh, actions or forming groups uh, in order to uh, transform uh, food systems. And and, the, and the, these, 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 uh, these, these actions, they can be very concrete, right? Like developing uh, um, a, a different way of managing the soil. Uh, they can be more political. They can also be more uh, kind of solidarity economy practices. Uh, we have actually a lot of examples uh, of these types of practices here in the, uh, in the Netherlands and in Europe as well. The importance of these practices is that, is that they are based on different values, and I think this is also where it touches upon degrowth, right? It's not about uh, practices uh, based on uh, profit and competition, but it's more based on uh, solidarity, uh, uh, being uh, closer to nature, these kind of values. So this is one of the things that uh, I do, but we also support agroecology in different, in other ways as well. Right within the Federation of Agroecological Farmers in the Netherlands, which is a, uh, a network of uh, six, six different farmer organizations that have joined forces mainly to try to influence uh, uh, policy processes going on here in the Netherlands so that they become more supportive of agroecology. Uh, the Agroecology Network, uh, which is a network which includes these farmer organizations, but also includes other organizations working on climate, 
uh, working uh, on the environment, uh, working on decoloniality, trying with this network to create also a, a bit of a broader movement so that we can influence um, influence or, or be a, a, a bigger force for transformation. Uh, and we do this in different ways, right? We, one of the ways is, can be very simple, is about sharing stories, podcasts, written stories uh, to inspire people. But we also give political trainings. Uh, we also lobby for different policies. Uh, for instance, to, um, to, 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 for access to land. Um, but also we try to do things that are more yeah, sometimes you don't think about, but but w to 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 make a transition towards agriculture, we also need financing, right? So this is also something important uh, that I work with, and then finally I also do part of my time. I'm also uh, connected to the University of Twente as a researcher, where actually I try to my my work in the movement is leading, and with the research of on Twente, I try to to study it a bit or to. To, to, to see, see, look for ways in which research can support as well. Thank you, Leonardo. Our third speaker is Laura van Oerts, um, PhD researcher in environmental governance of sustainable food systems here uh, at the University of Utrecht. Actually also active and maybe, you know, coordinating member of the Ontrui uh, network with the, the network of the growers in the Netherlands. Please check it up also. Um, welcome, uh, Laura. Thank you, Federico, and thank you for having me. And uh, I want to thank the presenters of this uh, earlier today as well. I think, uh, yeah, it was very fascinating to, to hear about the growth and different sort of styles of presentation, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, so um, I got the same question, uh, and I was also thinking, how does the growth inform my work? Um, so obviously I start thinking about my paid work immediately, which is already maybe questionable, but what I do um, uh, for a living at the moment is I'm a PhD student uh, here at Utrecht University, uh, where I try to uh, make sense of these transformations beyond capitalism through grassroots action, um, with a focus on the agri-food sector. Uh, and I think one of my main premises or assumptions or hypothesis there is that um, to reach a degrowth society is actually a project of unlearning. So the key concept that I use is unlearning, which I see as a sort of a deliberate and purposeful act to let go of certain beliefs and practices that no longer serve purpose uh, in our economies uh, for our well-being, but also for, our, uh, for sustainability in general. Um, and in order to, to study that process of unlearning or that pro project of unlearning, um, I try to stay away from this individual perspective where I simply say, okay, people, question, question your assumptions and your biases and try to do differently. But I try and understand how different spaces in society can be unlearning spaces where we collectively, in acts of solidarity, try and find alternative ways of living together and relating to each other and to nature, uh, not just as a project of learning, but also unlearning, and trying to confront some of these biases that we've all grown up with uh, through our educations and our learnings, uh, uh, just as being a citizens of the Netherlands. That is my key focus there. Um, so apart from research on these communities, I also try to be an active member of those communities uh, as much as I can. So. Um, indeed, it's Ontgroei, uh, more the degrowth movement, where I try to meet like-minded people in, yeah, in their struggles and in their stories and their joyful moments of um, embracing a degrowth society and what that actually means in practice. Uh, but I also try to make my hands dirty, working as a volunteer in the food garden every Friday. Um, and I was a member of Futsal Anders, which is another sort of national uh, network trying to connect uh, and network, uh, advocate for change uh, at, for the Dutch food system. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Next speaker is uh, Ross Satt. Uh, she's a farmer, an activist, and actually an organizer, an organizer in, uh, in the movement Extinction Rebellion Landbau, uh, and a student at the International Institute of Social Studies uh, in uh, Rotterdam. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so I, I have a lot of different, I don't know, I don't want to call it identities, but a lot of different places where I, I operate and where I live and where I am. Um, and I think in the center it's that I, I come from a, a farming family. Um, I grew up on a biodynamic organic farm. 
um, and it's also my wish or my desire for the future to become a farmer. Um, and I specifically said when I was asked for this panel, please don't write down that I'm a farmer, I'm a part-time farmer. Uh, I'm not a full farmer yet, um, because I'm also a student and I'm also an activist. And the, um, I think that the, the sometimes for people confusing mixture of, well, you're a farmer and then you're also an Extinct Rebellion, how does that work? Um, for me, it's a very natural way that my questioning of, I want to become a farmer, what do I need to become a farmer in the Netherlands? And then um, the challenges that I see my family has and also colleagues um, of, m of me have currently is that there is a very intense battle, I would almost say, with the current corporate dominated capitalist food system that we have. And it is really, really challenging and complicated to navigate your way around that especially because a lot of farmers do this on their, in their own spaces, um, a lot of in individual work, hard work, um, in building alternative systems, but, but there's also a very, very powerful current system that's still in place. Um, and I think in order for, for me and for a lot of my colleagues to have a future in farming, there is a need of challenging that system. And that is how I ended up with Extinction Rebellion in a way saying, well, we need to also not only build the alternatives, we need to, to challenge the powers that are there. Um, and the climate movement has a very strong focus on, of course, the, the topic of climate change, on the issue of fossil fuels, but then there's also the industrial agricultural system, which is the second largest cause of, of emissions worldwide. Um, and and both a, and a need for um, talking to a climate activist about the importance of our food system and transforming our food system and the idea that farmers are not in its essence necessarily the problem and I think we also talked a bit about that this morning. Um, and in a similar way talking to farmers about how climate activists can be allies in their struggle. Um, and that's how, how I, yeah, I ended up also being an activist. Um, and then also currently studying to better understand how these these places of power and these transformations work. Um, and then there was the question, what does degrowth mean in your daily life? And um, I find that a complicated question and, and I was thinking about it for a while. And I was talking to my mom um, about it recently when I was at the farm. Um, and she said, well, what does degrowth mean? And I tried to explain it to her and she was like, okay, but that's what we do. Like, that's what we do, and I don't really see why, why do we have to have another name for what we do, which is agroecological farming. And then there needs to be this, this other term that we use. Um, and to me, that is kind of fundamental to also the struggle that I have when I am in academic spaces. And there's a lot of talking about and a lot of imagining about a different future and talking about pathways. And, and then I'm at the farm and there is such a different struggle going on there. And it's a really almost as if it's two different worlds. And I think it's a, maybe also a question for the degrowth movement to what extent, what is the relation to the farmers and how do you relate to them? How do you support them? And I think also some of the topics that were addressed this morning. Um, so to an extent, degrowth is very much the essence of what we do at our farm. And at the same time, it's also very much a, a very abstract academic field and I think there is an, a connection there that, that can be, uh, be made stronger. Yeah, I think that was my, my introduction for now. Thanks. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have Christine uh, Tönissen, uh, and she's a member of the Dutch Parliament, uh, uh, representative of the Partij van de Dieren, the Party of the Animals, translation in English, for the animals. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Um, so, what does degrowth mean to my daily work? Well, I actually uh, am from a kind of a degrowth family. Uh, my parents didn't have a car, and they were already vegan before I was born. So, there were some values uh, printed in my head already. And um, then, um, in a way, I started working in politics when I uh, ended my history studies. I wanted to do an internship and I found a party for the animals. And I thought, well, uh, I'm almost always worrying about uh, what, uh, what influence our way of doing in the Western countries has on other countries. I was uh, 
concerned about that and I was seeing how much we are polluting and how much uh, we are wasting also with agriculture because actually livestock farming is a kind of waste because you need like seven kilos of grain to feed to, to have one kilo of meat and you can also feed that directly to humans so that I was worrying about and then I suddenly saw this party for the animals and I thought wow this is uh, something this is really a different putting different values uh, in the front line in politics, not economical growth, but animals, animal welfare as a starting point. And I found it very interesting. And I've, I said to myself, well, why, why not try there to do an internship and see what will come uh, from it? Well, that totally got off, out of hand because uh, then I started to work in the parliament as a press officer. Then I went to do uh, local politics. I, I was the, uh, the party leader, local party leader of the uh, Party for the Animals in The Hague. And uh, then I went into the Senate. So I became a senator for the Party for the Animals. And now I'm in uh, Parliament. So it got a little out of hand. But um, uh, what, uh, what the main point is in our vision is that not economical growth is in the center of policy, but the interests of all living beings on the planet. Uh, and their animals is our starting point. But uh, of course, we have a, uh, a planet broad vision because when you start with animals and you see the way they are treated into the farming industry, you see also how nature is being treated, how humans are being treated, so that you can draw that line all the way through, uh, through a total different uh, system. And that's where we stand for in politics. And uh, as we talk about agriculture, I think that's one of the, the most important uh, degrowth concerns that we have, because we really, really need to urgently change our food system towards a plant-based system. I was telling about uh, the waste that livestock is causing at the moment, but it's not only uh, the waste of food, it's also, of course, deforestation, suffering of animals, also the pollution of the, the soil, the uh, so all these kinds of, all these problems we can tackle together if we change our food system fundamentally. And how does, do I do that in my daily work? Well, I give you two examples. Uh, one of them is that we try to reduce the amount of livestock in the Netherlands by 75%. Um, and uh, one of the things that is really important to ban is the EU subsidies because uh, the EU subsidizes the, the factory farming with 28 billion. Uh, so that's one of the things that blocks your, uh, your way of doing agriculture. So that's one of the things we want to ban. But also uh, in my, my, one of my portfolios is uh, trade agreements, free trade agreements. And those uh, agreements are for free trade and also more production. For instance, I have the New Zealand um, free trade agreement, which is uh, recently uh, well uh, made, to, got to an agreement, and that will mean more imports of fish, cheese, and kiwis from New Zealand. Of course, that's ridiculous. So we need to make the transition toward regional regional foods, and there, therefore I make a stand against uh, free trade agreements. And now the Merc Mercosur treatment, uh, we are successfully fighting. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. So, in fact, uh, you already answered also the second question I had for the panel, which was I more... more. Yeah, okay. <laughs> then let's do that. We, we will go back to you. While you prepare your question, your thoughts, um, actually, uh, me and Giuseppe thought about asking also a question that would invite the panelists to be a bit more incisive and sharp on what uh, we could do for the agri-food system if we are really taking degrowth seriously. So what type of policies or tools you see, uh, you know, put in place, um, degrow inspired. So we're inviting you all to be a bit more prescriptive to a certain degree, maybe a less analytical, also because then it will help the discussion later. I will uh, take uh, the, I would say the order starting from uh, uh, Leonardo there. Um, if you want, you can use this or you can press the... Yeah, you have to keep it in and then use this one. Okay. <laughs> Very impractical, this microphone. <laughs> Okay, um, so I think the question was, what do we need to do, right? And to me, 
I was thinking about this and I thought I could come up with different uh, type of policies or practices, but at the core, at least to me, what we need to do is we need to build movements. We need to build movements that can push for the transformation of this food system, because this transformation is not going to come from within the system. Um, we need movements that can challenge uh, power, right? Because there's a lot of power holding the system uh, intact, a lot of power from agribusiness, from corporations, and this can only be challenged through a uh, movement, right? Um, we, don't, we also need a movement to support the construction of uh, alternative practices, right? Of, 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 uh, of solidarity economies, of commons, of agri alternative agri agricultural practices. Um, we need also a movement to change uh, policies uh, that are actually destroying the lives of many farmers. And this, one of these policies here in the Netherlands, I think that is interesting, is, is the policy on land. Uh, at the moment, we have a land system. Um, well, I work for Toekomstwood, and many of our members, they are small-scale farmers uh, who uh, rent uh, land, right? The land is way too expensive to buy, so many of, many of them rent land. But the Dutch legislation says, uh, makes it possible for landowners to rent land for uh, one year, right? So many of our members, um, they only have a one-year contract, which makes it very difficult for them uh, to think about the future, but also to invest in things like planting trees uh, and things like that. So this system of land in the Netherlands is really uh, actually marginal, further marginalizing small-scale farmers. Another example is uh, the gecombineerde opgave. Uh, gecombineerde opgave is actually a kind of administrative thing that you can, uh, you have to fill in if you want to formally be a farmer. But it's a very complicated form. You have to fill in for every, uh, if you have a piece of land, you have to fill in for every crop, for every crop you have to fill in how much do you put in, how much do you get out, uh, what is the area of this. Many of our members, they grow uh, for example, they have diverse systems. Some of them have uh, over 90 different crops uh, working in systems. How are they going to fill this in? So they don't. They don't fill this in. And instead, um, they, they, then, they don't become formally registered as farmers, which you think, well, whatever. But it is a problem because if you don't have the gecombineerde opgave, you have no rights to uh, subsidies. All right? so, uh, there's a lot of money, uh, European subsidies, going uh, to agriculture, but none of it is going at least to our members and very little of it is going to sustainable farmers. So this is something that we need to change. Um, we need also, th this is also something that's occurring internationally. We need to press, uh, we need a movement to push for the rights uh, of people that are being excluded by capitalism, right? And, and, and one of the things that we did through uh, La Via Campesina uh, it's not only La Via Campesina, but it's a process that was led by La Via Campesina, is uh, United Declarations on the Rights of uh, People Living in Rural Areas, of peasants and people, other people living in rural areas. And this uh, kind of gives uh, um, a, a legitimacy uh, to the struggles that many of peasants have, right, regarding access to land, regarding safeguarding biodiversity, but also regarding their uh, right to seeds. Um, and then finally, I think that uh, if we want to build a movement, it has to be a, a democratic movement. And an example of this is, I think, La Via Campesina itself. La Via Campesina is a worldwide peasant movement. We have 182 different member organizations in 81 different countries. And each of these 182 organizations, they have farmer members, right? And farmers within these organizations all have a voice um, regarding how the organization should be steered and what kind of transformation uh, do we want. So it's a very democratic organization. Um, but we cannot do this as peasant uh, organizations by ourselves. We need uh, to join our hands with other movements. We need to join our hands with the climate movement. We need to join our hands with uh, movements of the coloniality, of indigenous peoples, of fishers, of environments. And then I think maybe we can change the system.
Thank you very much, Leonardo. I resonate a lot with what you just mentioned. Um, for me, the question about policies and action is a question about power. And it's a question of where the power is allocated and what type of power do we feel we have to change the situation we are currently living in. Um, so degrowth, if, if it's trying to be a political project, which I think it is, <laughs> um, and trying to think about new economies, of course, and, and what we were discussing previously before the break is that um, there are so many things that are, are already in place that we are now um, trying to see through the degrowth lenses, but they're already in place. So change is already in place. The ways, uh, or the question is, how do we make sense of the changes? And how do we sustain maybe uh, and give power to the ones that we think deserve it. Um, and I, I think um, ecofeminism has taught me at least a lot, or uh, an important contribution that I think from ecofeminism is um, to challenge the idea of the hierar hierarchical dualisms. So the Western uh, culture, and I, I will try to be pragmatic with my answer. I know you were like looking for um, policies and actions uh, concretely, but for me it's hard to talk about concrete things without giving some context. Um, so ecofeminist uh, thought tried to challenge the idea of hierarchical dualisms that has organized our Western thought for many, many uh, centuries. So the idea that the world um, is divided in men and women, global north, global south, or uh, nature culture has uh, been divisions that have organized our minds um, and uh, structure the way we we organize in life and economy is of course part of that uh, if you think about capitalist economy it's um, just considering the pr the production side not seeing the reproduction side is just focused on human beings not seeing nature and other um, life cycles or ecosystems. So it's just um, the capitalist economy is just focused on one side of the dualism, so to say, and this is prioritized. Um, and I think the invitation for uh, of degrowth and ecofeminism and many other alternative economies is to um, broaden the perspective and to incorporate other elements. Um, so I tried to do this exercise of, okay, if we are not only looking at uh, people and production, maybe we can have an extended grid and maybe uh, you can also uh, draw it on your um, notebooks, um, production, reproduction, people, nature, and we can, of course, uh, include more more variables on there, and then we can see policies and uh, actions that we can take in each of the corner, so to say. So, for example, uh, when I'm thinking in in the production and people uh, corner, I'm thinking about um, unions. The the need to have unionism in farming, it's very relevant. It's not happening. It's so um, unregulated that it's something that we have to push forward. And Amudi, the National Association of um, uh, Rural Peasant and Indigenous People in Chile, also part of La Vía Campesina, uh, they created um, a union of women uh, of the land and the sea four years ago. There is no union for women that are not part of um, formal, um, that are not part, part of the formal economy. They are just seasonal workers. There are no unions for seasonal workers. So we need to start thinking about unionism for the seasonal workers, for example. We need to start um, doing policies for workers' rights. Uh, access to land is, is very relevant, land grabbing, in Latin America, in, in Africa, in Asia, is a huge problem. If we don't tackle land grabbing, uh, if we don't uh, ensure access to land, access to water, access to seas, seats, 
uh, understanding them as commons, not as natural resources that we can extract and extract, um, then we, we, we will not see change. So examples, um, I could continue policies on food sovereignty, um, and then on the production and nature grid um, on that side of, like, on that corner, we can think about agroecology, peasant family farming, uh, many regulations. Um, but then the invitation is to also look on the reproduc reproduction side, right? Because we were thinking about this, this column of production, people and nature. Um, but what if we think about the reproduction side? And I think it's something that it's invisibilized, right? Uh, we know that the, um, especially the caring activities, especially conducted by women, but not only, um, at the household level is invisibilized. It's not part of the formal economy. If we are trying to think about new economies, degrowth in, in, that, um, in that way should also think about um, care policies, caring policies. Um, universal basic income is part of it. I know it's part of the, um, of the conversation of, of degrowth policies. Uh, and I think it would be very relevant to have that conversation. How could universal basic income impact the way farming activities is conducted? Um, because most of the time, um, especially in, in the global south, um, the food production is part of a caring activity. It's not part of the formal economy, it's part of basically what women do on a daily basis in their, in their households. They produce food as they, they, as they cook, as they serve, as they clean, as they raise their kids, and as they do activism as well for their community. So um, we need to set the focus on the reproductive activities. Um, and in the reproduction side, but also in the other corner, on, on the nature part of the reproduction side, um, I love the, the work of uh, Stefania Barca, what she's doing with the concept of earth care. Um, I think it's very relevant that we consider earth care policies. What does that mean? Um, well, I think generative, um, regenerative agriculture is doing a great uh, work on that. Uh, but for me, uh, earth care policies, it's all about respecting and acknowledging that other beings have other cycles and we need to respect their uh, times. We need to respect the time of the earth, the soil, the plants. We need to give them time to rest for being productive. So part of also a policy of earth care could also be, okay, I will not do anything. I will not, produ I will not be productive or I will not ask the earth to be productive. Um, I will leave it there. I will welcome any question. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, both of you. I think um, if I had to uh, choose, these would be the ones. Uh, so okay. thank you very much. Um, but for the sake of discussion, let me add some. Uh, I think uh, uh, Jakob, Yuli, and David, you already introduced some as well, like uh, on the macro level skills as well, talking about banning of advertisement, I think is very important there. Um, but let me, let me give some, some suggestions, uh, uh, some humble suggestions, as I'm a PhD researcher, not a politician, uh, but some ideas that I think might help to foster this sort of community and unlearning processes, or at least recognize the importance of these spaces uh, for our own well-beings uh, and for the, uh, for the sake of sustainability. Uh, so some of the things that I wrote down in my in my book here is, uh, I think part of it is of course to do with the sort of the type of work that we value and the valuing of non-paid paid work, uh, which also comes close to what what we've just discussed. But also trying to understand of how we how we organize our cities or how we organize our uh, space. Um, so trying to reclaim public space. Um, so why do we have so many so many car parks, for example? Can, can we reclaim those spaces for food uh, and for joyous moment in nature? Um, participatory budgeting, which is something that has been 
working very effectively in, uh, in Barcelona, for example, where local communities themselves decide on what they want to do with that space. Uh, and maybe they want, uh, uh, what actually shows is that they want more nature and they want to be spaces where they can, can meet and come together. Uh, so I think that could be very helpful as well to, to, to supporting the type of communities that we need. Um, thinking being here at the university and thinking uh, also as a researcher, one of the important things that also comes to mind is how we might need to transform our education and our educational systems drastically in trying to also understand what do we teach, how do we teach, um, uh, what are the type of topics, uh, but also the pedagogies that we bring into our teaching, uh, which I think also need to, to acknowledge more of these safe spaces uh, where we grieve together, where we celebrate together uh, the type of uh, climate change and drastic changes that we're all experiencing in our personal and collective lives. Uh, I wrote down some others, but I will, I will give down the microphone to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, then you have to follow up uh, three people that have already said a lot of things that I also agree with. Um, I think at the core, it's, it's important to, to think about when we talk about policy or action, um, who we put at the core of our movement. And I think if we talk about degrowth, um, especially it coming from a very academic background, um, I think it's really important to go into the field and actually ask those that are producing and those that are working in our, uh, in our food systems what they need. Um, especially because we are, as academics, and I now speak as an academic myself, we are really good at um, always uh, thinking, oh, what might we be able to do, or what can we do, and go and visit farmers and ask a hundred questions. Um, and I think that's really important, but farmers are also uh, already doing a lot, and um, all, all extra things. I mean, the reason that I can go study is because there are people working a lot harder at home, and they are doing that work, and they can't do advocacy or don't have then the time to talk to a researcher to answer their questions or um, or because they, they face an, an immediate struggle. I mean, what was talked about, the access to land is such as a direct threat to farmers that are working alternative food systems that like my, my parents are like, well, have fun at a degrowth conference and it's really nice that you're going, but we uh, are gonna lose 40 hectares of our land if we don't act now and we have to put that through a whole system of bureaucracy and wait years and there's a, uh, it, it's, it works on such a different time scale and a different, I guess, immediate level of, of concern. Um, so I think in, in the end it's about asking what kind of action and what kind of policy do we need and, and there the political aspect of degrowth becomes extremely important. Because if we, we think about action in a system that, is our capitalist system that is inherently exploitative, we also need to think, okay, if we're gonna implement policy or action, is that gonna just sustain the system that we already have and how, or can it challenge it or can it transform it? Um, and there, I think the solidarity of the degrowth movement with farmers, but also the position that the degrowth movement has as an academic institute in challenging corporate power, in challenging uh, and supporting grassroots movements is extremely important because as an academic there is so much more power and influence you have in certain spaces that a lot of other people don't. And then in those moments, taking solidarity with the people that are on the ground is such an important thing to do that maybe is not even as visible in that moment, but it means so much because then it means that if an academic goes and challenge a political party or goes and challenge and, 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 and talk about um, the policy that is needed at a, at a governmental level, a farmer can continue and do what they're doing on the field rather than also having to do that. And I think that is that maybe at the core to add to, in order to reach the, the things that also were talked about now, I think that is really, really important to, to take along. And in doing so sometimes, um, yeah, using your voice, using your position, and also not being afraid to, um, yeah, maybe rub people a little bit the wrong way because I think that is really important. Um, and challenge those places that the money comes from and those places that have a lot of power over our academic institute over what we need to do. I think that um, in the end, yeah, can do a lot, a lot more. Yeah, thanks.
I will keep it very short. You already said something about yes, I <laughs> already said something. I want to add only to uh, what Maria Mariana was saying about power. It's all about power, and I can see that in politics because we, are, as a party for the animals, have a range of uh, policy measures. But in the end, it comes on do you have a majority to actually uh, obtain them? And for instance, what um, Leonardo was saying about the division of land uh, and also supporting farmers who do it in a, su a sustainable way, uh, why, why are they not supported? That's because of the power. So uh, I would suggest that, that uh, uh, not here to, to have an election um, talk, <laughs> But I would no, not really, not. I'm trying to do like to 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 focus on the content. But uh, I would suggest also to become politically active, and that's not only not only in our party, but also other parties become politically active. But also uh, like urgent matters, you can lobby for that as well. Not only with our party, but also with other parties. Uh, uh, agendas, you can put it on the agenda, and you can, uh, yeah, you can let hear your voice. For instance, to support these farmers who have the future, and uh, so that's my final call. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. I leave this microphone to you later. I will use that one. So, questions? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, we we proceed as we did before. Okay. Okay. I like this toy. I will indirect the answer. To yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much uh, for the panel. Um, my name is Natalia. I am a PhD student at Utrecht University. I come from Ukraine, and um, my question, yeah, will be maybe a bit more philosophical, uh, related to degrowth and agroecology movements. So, uh, my question is like, okay, so how this local action can really uh, in practice counteract this big uh, global social uh, well, economic and political drivers and i base it on ukrainian example so now we see the biggest threat to food security is russia's invasion of ukraine because and we can say it is one of the like russian imperialism is now based on this extreme capitalism and concentration of power in one hands of one person so we can see that this big power concentration, it's really hard to counteract it with this local self-organization movements uh, because power, they don't want to give away <laughs> the power, uh, obviously. Uh, so I wonder, yeah, how is it possible? And um, I, I can just say on a positive note that, uh, of course, uh, self-organization can help people uh, because I know some villages which were in the occupation, uh, people who united uh, and like transferred food from one place to another under the fire. They saved people from basically dying from hunger. So this is very powerful, but you have this global power that has all the resources <laughs> and all the political and economical powers. So it seems to me that it's impossible to do on, well, there has to be some kind of global um, connection, like uh, support, solidarity across. Because if you do it in one country, then the other country can, I don't know, apply this uh, extreme capitalist model and to counteract all your efforts, uh, it seems. But then it's a very, very big task. Uh, it seems to be, <laughs> sorry. Thank yeah. you. Well, so there it's Kuros and, uh, and uh, Leonardo, because I think they are at the front line of it as a movement, as an international network. <laughs> yeah, I, I will leave the part about La Via Campesina being a part of this answer to Leonardo, um, although I can also say that I think um, international solidarity is extremely important and understanding how struggles on a very local level are connected to struggles in other places. Um, but also thinking about, this is an extremely difficult question, I'm not gonna provide you with an answer, sorry, but like I think I'm thinking about the place that we are in the Netherlands, and especially if you look at our food system, the um, massive corporations that either are um, originating from the Netherlands or that are really, have a really stronghold in the Netherlands um, that have a lot of influence on uh, the, the kind of speculation that happens to our food. We as people in the Netherlands, but I mean we all, all have different power roles in this, 
um, have, I think, a responsibility to challenge those places. And I think that there are certain things that people in the Netherlands can do better than maybe someone who is, you know, at a, at a front line in, in, for example, in Ukraine. And since that we here um, have the offices where these corporations are seated, and we as a um, as uh, the economics, but as, as people, and I think uh, the term activist is always very much reserved for, oh, then you're an activist, but I think everyone should be or has to be, um, can challenge these places. And, and this, I mean, the, an example that, that has happened over the years from Extinction Rebellion, a campaign that we've been running against the Rabobank, is to a, a certain way, a little bit to answer this question, but I'm definitely not going to say, oh, now we changed the world, but um, basically, what we decided as climate activists is thinking, okay, we need a transformation in our food system. Where can you, where do you start? We always talk about this, oh yeah, as a farmer you need to change, oh yeah, as a consumer you need to change. But then in the middle behind there is a lot of influence on why a farmer farms the way they farm and why a consumer eats the things they eat, and there is a lot of financial power behind that. And then in the case of the Rabobank, they are the biggest um, sub financial supporter of industrial agriculture in the Netherlands, but also globally. Um, so we started a campaign against the Rabobank, um, and we challenged them in many ways, and we did it through direct action, we did it through petitions, we did it through talking with them, we did it through, um, uh, yeah, occupying their lobby, um, a lot of different things. And the one thing that you notice is that, oh, this is a really giant tower and there's a lot of people on up top, and we never talk to them, but they get scared. They actually get scared. And you can see it happening in the way that they talk to you, the way that the police react to you being there, the way that they um, try to defend themselves in the media, but also the narrative around the rubber bank transforming quite drastically, especially now during the nitrogen crisis, um, about what actually is their position and what actually are they going to be able to do or why do we need them for a new food system? Like, are they not just the ones that are delaying the change that we need? Um, and it is very, it's, it's small to a certain extent, but it has a massive impact. And I think those are the kinds of places that we, especially here in the West, can uh, take our uh, position in doing so, yeah. Just to build on what uh, Ross is saying. Uh, well, first of all, I think uh, there is a lot of power, right, in local initiatives. And I think we already discussed this a bit. Uh, but you're right, I think, to say that if uh, we want to counter bigger powers, we do need to also unite uh, as local initiatives. Uh, but at the same time, we also have to be careful because we also want to be locally grounded, right? We do not want to have big organizations, as you can see with many big NGOs, um, that do have a lot of power, but have actually very little idea of what is going on in the, on the ground. Um, so, well, I want to repeat actually the example of La Via Campesina, because I think it's a very nice example of how you can build a movement that is active in, in an international level, that has quite some power, um, but that at the same time is uh, also very much grounded in the realities of farmers uh, in different countries. Um, and as I said, like, so La Via Campesina, we have 182 different uh, organizations in uh, 80, 81 different countries. Um, and it, it's very important uh, for us uh, to have also a kind of a coherent vision um, uh, also to, uh, to, to deal with what you were saying about you have to have some sort of coherence uh, between different alternatives in different countries <laughs> against this power. So we have a lot of um, uh, 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 gatherings and meetings. Meetings are very important within La Via Campesina to get, get an understanding of uh, each other's contacts, uh, to really formulate uh, a, a, a voice in union uh, against uh, power. So this would be, I think, my my recommendation, I say follow this example uh, and let's see if we can do more of this bringing together local initiatives into uh, bigger structures of power. Thank you, Renat. Uh, thank you. My name is Leonard Frank. I'm a, a researcher at the University of Freiburg. And so quite a few of you have spoken about um, the importance of power. And I was wondering, um, 
Well, essentially, who are, you, who are your main opponents um, working towards a degrowth transition, both from a, a researcher but also an activist um, stance? Or is that the wrong question to ask? <laughs> no, no, who is the enemy? It's a good question. Uh, I would ask maybe the other three that didn't speak now. Okay. Briefly. Um, okay, it's a very important question. Um, and I think we do not dare so much to think about them because they are people behind agribusiness. They are families who are actually profit, profiting from agribusiness. From There are many politicians taking decisions uh, in favor of agribusiness. Um, there are so many transnational that seems to be like a cloud that are present everywhere, but no one knows who's behind that. And there are people working uh, on, like, to push this model forward, to move, to, to move capitalism. So we have to consider that. And I think one key aspect of degrowth as a political project, um, and Giuseppe mentioned that um, in, at the beginning of the, um, of, of the symposium today, degrowth wants to be a democratic project. And in general, <laughs> democracy works with political parties. And I think the degrowth movement in general feels a bit uncomfortable with the idea of becoming a political party. Um, I will leave it there because I think it's a, a big conversation. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to think about the way um, we, or degrowth, I'm not sure if I belong, but <laughs> yeah, maybe we, um, organize and become part of like the official and democratic ways of disputing power. Thank you. Laura? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I will try and answer this uh, in my role as a researcher. And I think one of something that I feel like is really keeping me uh, from researching degrowth and degrowth in transformation is this sort of idea that when challenging growth, you're challenging something that is taken for granted. While well, I think that there is a myth around this fact that economic growth is inherently a good thing. And I think as a researcher, but I mean, not only as a researcher, I think we should challenge these questions. Like how did this narrative come into being? Who is pushing it? Uh, why? Is it something that we just simply believe in and that we can also toss aside and believe in something else? Uh, and I, yeah, so I, I guess that is my, mo my biggest struggle in, in, in constantly having to advocate and defend myself uh, for not believing in this dream of economic growth anymore. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting question. I could write a whole book about yeah, it. No, think, please. But I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Sorry. No. Um, what I see where we are fighting against is uh, also the entanglement between politics and companies. And uh, well, the, the interests are very, very big. If you look at the agricultural business, it's not the farmers who profit from this system, but it's like the supermarkets and uh, the, the animal feed companies. They are profiting and they, have, uh, they are putting all their efforts to, uh, and their money to keep it the way it is. So that's why it's so difficult to uh, abolish the, the subsidies for the factory farming. And also if you see uh, the pesticides industry, and of course it's the same the, in, the, in pharmacy, also big industries, big interests. Um, so that is why uh, where we are uh, fighting against, but it's also, uh, so it's not only the, um, uh, the, the change of the system, it's also that we have to change um, yeah, the, the political system in itself. So we have to make sure that there are people there who do everything from the, um, uh, the main interest and not uh, a specific interest from a company. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we face at the moment, not only in the Netherlands, but also in the EU. Thank you, Christine. So I take two questions. There was one here in the middle, and then one here, and then there's two there, and then there. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Renz, PhD uh, at uh, Wageningen. Uh, um, and I think my question goes a bit, uh, a bit linked uh, from the one uh, that is just uh, but a bit more practical. 
in the sense that in the perspective of like uh, reducing like the amount of livestock, uh, for example, like the, the So far, really a lot on is either the wood supply side or either uh, producing <coughs> like nothing. And uh, what I, I can anticipate to think about is actually uh, what do we do with the, the farmers actually that are completely stuck in a system with like a farm with high investment and that actually can't shift uh, easily actually uh, their uh, production. It's stuck in a very difficult. Where? Yeah, there. Sorry, one second. More down. Should I throw it? Hi, uh, I'm Siux. Uh, I'm PhD. In I'm Siux. I'm. Ah, oh, sorry. I'm Siux. I'm PhD in, uh, here in Utrecht University. And my question is more in the you know, other side that you were explaining. All of you were talking about the production side. So I'm thinking about what strategies can, have you ever thought about the consumption side? Because if you don't, if you start thinking about changing the dietary consumption and everything like that, there is a problem that there is a, these cultural things that people don't change very easily and if you produce something and they don't change their uh, consumption patterns, there will be an increase in food waste. So how to tackle this problem? Okay. So there were two questions. Maybe we can divide between two people. The first is, how do we um, enable those farmers that want to shift to agroecological system of production? So what tools do we give them? And the second is, what type of policies for shifting uh, Consumption, uh, consumption, so dietary uh, choices. Who would like to do the first? Yes, okay. Um, thank you for the questions. The first one, I think we can help farmers by um, helping them financially. That's uh, one of the, the, thing, the things that is happening now because the government has uh, made free some funds a billion, uh, like 20 billion, 24 billion euros to help them uh, shifting. Only you have to make good like goals to where are we going. And now f farmers don't have any perspective. And uh, so they are stuck now, uh, very much stuck by policies in the past, by um, making them believe that they can grow, uh, giving them um, uh, they, could, they could borrow a lot of money from the banks for growing and scaling up and now they are stuck and so what we have to do is giving them subsidies to change and to um, yeah and to help them with the perspective uh, to where to go to so those two have to uh, be taken and, and the, the, the next question was how can we do something on the consumer side I think uh, prices are very uh, useful so now uh, vegetables have a very high price, um, people can't afford it, almost, and meat is still very, very cheap. So what we can do is changing the prices there, making sure that pollution of products is being counted also in the prices, and that makes it far more profitable to buy vegetables instead of uh, meat. Thank you. But the first question would like just to one to make it precise. When we talk about farmers, are we talking about all farmers, or there are different types? Uh, or I mean, just to just to be clear, maybe Ross or Leonardo can can respond this just briefly. I think the specific question was about farmers that are basically stuck right now, and I think there's farmers that have an ability to move towards a, uh, a more sustainable farming system because either they have the land or they have some capital or uh, they can arrange something with their local government. But there, we shouldn't forget that there are a lot of farmers who right now, especially dairy, dairy farmers, who have, for example, 200 uh, cows, 20 hectares of land. There is no way that that farmer can transition to a sustainable system without well, going bankrupt because they don't have that, that space to move around. Um, 
And I think to a certain extent, helping these farmers is extremely important, giving them perspective to do so. Um, I would then challenge that right now the government has created this 25 billion uh, euro subsidy box to provide to these farmers. Um, but I think that the reason that these farmers are in these positions is because they have gotten money from banks and they've uh, had a lot of big corporations that profit from the position they are in now. And I think that these corporations need to pay for those 25 billion and not the taxpayer that first gets you know, basically handed with the receipt and also the damage outside. Um, so I think that is, that is extremely important and they're in challenging and taking, basically challenging these corporations saying, well, you caused this mess. So you're going to be the first one to clean it up. Um, and then also ensuring that when we transition to a different system, that corporate power doesn't immediately solidify again, um, but ensure that these farmers have their right and their own say over their seeds, their land, uh, the, other, the other things that they are dependent on on inputs. Um, and it's no longer uh, the corporation basically what well, the three corporations worldwide that, that decide for almost all the seeds that we have. Yeah. Um, and that, that doesn't happen just again, yeah. Thank you, Ross. Um, Leonardo, yeah. Yes, I, I just want to quickly input. build on what uh, Ross is saying because it's very much in the same line. Um, I'm not sure if we can have a policy that will actually help this transition, as Ross was saying. What we need is a, actually a, a very different uh, system because the current system is very much, in, especially here in the Netherlands, it's quite an extreme situation where the agricultural system is very much oriented towards high production, towards export, uh, towards importing raw materials, and we need to change this entire uh, uh, system. We need to move uh, towards a system uh, where food, but also land uh, is not not a commodity uh, a anymore. And within La Via Campesina, we also have been already advocating for the free trade agreements um, within the whole degrowth transformation and there's quite little about it yet so uh, to you Christine I'm wondering how you're actually um, also within a political debate how you are um, if and how you're encountering uh, issues or um, well yeah in what way you encountered WTO and free trade agreements in what way you are combating against it if it is possible in any way um, but also to the other speakers, how you perceive the role of the WTO in it, and if there's a shift possible. First, I will take another question there behind you. Thank you. I'm Martina. I'm a global sustainability science student, and I had quite a similar question by regarding lobbying. So you mentioned that questions of policies are questions of power, and I think we can confidently say that uh, like the largest agricultural lobby in the European Union has the most power to influence policies, like they almost didn't pass the nature restoration law, for example, because of all the pushing from that lobby. So how do you approach that? How can you push for a new system when you have such an imbalance on power? Question for yeah, Christine, international yes. agreements yes, and geopolitics. Agreements. Well, what are you doing there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, what we do, what you now see is that these trade agreements beca be became larger and lar larger, and now there are mainly trade agreements between EU and other countries or even combinations of countries. Um, so you see South American countries made this trade agreement Mercosur with, and, uh, with the EU, and that's going on at this moment. And uh, we, every country in the EU has a voice there. So what we try to do is, we, uh, and we, we actually achieved it, because also the farmer 
parties in the Netherlands are against free treatments because of the uh, uneven competition these treatments cause, are causing by getting more production from other countries. So that's why we got uh, a majority in parliament against um, the Mercosur Treaty. Uh, so that's nice, but you see uh, that the minister, she doesn't want to act. She, she doesn't want to uh, get the motion through, so she, she doesn't say the standing point, what's the standing point of the Netherlands in the EU. So we're trying to push that now. Um, and as long as a lo enough countries in the EU are against Mercosur Treaty, it doesn't go through. So there the Netherlands has a voice. Uh, and we are hopeful that we are succeeding there, um, as, well, for the Netherlands. I don't know about other countries. I, I think Austria has also has, has said uh, that they are against it. So that's uh, quite exciting what's happening there. Um, so we can, we can, um, uh, rest how do you call it? We, we can say no to it, but it's very, uh, it's, it's a very hard fight. Mm. Um, yeah, and that counts also for the other treaties. And you have also this new kind of treaties who are only uh, EU only. So they, can't, they, they don't come through the national parliaments. Mm. So the national parliaments they can't vote about it. So what we're trying to do as well is um, make sure that the Mercosur Treaty is being, uh, is se being sent to the national parliaments. And therefore, we also delivered a motion which was supported by parliament. So that's why how we try to influence it. Thank you. There was also a question about the lobby. So who would like to reflect on the, on the role of lobbyists and lobbyists? Maybe yeah. Leonardo, maybe are you, are you actually performing lobbying uh, with the vehicle and how do you do it? Yeah. Yeah. Difficult? Yeah, yeah, something is enough. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I, I, yeah, actually, I, I just, I am doing some lobby work uh, mainly within the uh, FAO um, to actually to push indeed uh, towards more agroecological and food sovereignty <laughs> type of systems. But I think I just want to repeat what Christina said. It's a very hard fight, uh, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Thank you. Can I just add something on, on trade agreements? Um, it's very difficult because the origin of trade agreements is actually very functional to, to capitalism and growth. So um, the, the question on trade agreements is it's actually a, a question of sovereignty, right? And in general, food, mo food movements that promote food sovereignty are trying to regulate trade agreements because what, they, what trade agreements actually do is deregulate, so allow the, the market to, to set um, and organize the way food is produced, for example. So um, it's very important to understand that we need more regulation. And the way to do more regulation in the food systems, maybe it will not come from trade agreements. Maybe it will come from um, structural nation, uh, national changes. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe the national level is very relevant here because um, n like nation states are the ones who are signing the agreements. So I think uh, if we don't regulate political constitutions, for example, it's very hard um, to, to think about regulating the whole capitalistic system. Okay, um, good afternoon. First of all, I will uh, congratulate the organizers of this symposium. My name is Tamsir, Tamsir Sala from the Gambia. So I'm currently um, undergoing one program in Wageningen University under the uh, Food System Chair Group that is exploring the future of farming and food. I'm also um, a climate change activist, part of uh, Yongo, that is the official youth and children consequence under the UNTFOC, under the uh, Loss and Damage Working Group, and also the Adaptation Working Group. I was in Bonn, Germany um, in June where we had the SV, SV58. We used to have a lot of collaboration and bilaterals with the EU head of delegates and knowing fully well about uh, the farming system in the Netherlands, I'm so much concerned about like government regulations and policies regarding 
uh, the farming system in the Netherlands because considering like how probably disadvantaged farmers are within the Netherlands and uh, having an approach from the government side where they have to uh, maybe cut down like you no know, production level within the farming system in the Netherlands is like for me it is somehow a bit worrying so my quick question will be how uh, like you know farmers will well inform about the uh, the new uh, approach where as they have to cut down their cost of production especially in the livestock uh, sector despite we know probably um, like you know we already know in the Netherlands like they have a lot of nitrogen and then they feel like okay maybe about 45 percent of the nitrogen emitted is uh, from agricultural sector and then we understood that you know the livestock production and we understood like you no know, livestock emit a lot of like you know this uh, greenhouse gas like methane it is important that we, we, we revisit our farming system, but and how well farmers are informed about the, the, the new approach, because I know it will be to their own detriment or to their own disadvantage. How is the government involving and like having collaboration with farmers, even though they have to shift their farming system probably to a more conventional approach? Will it be like something sustainable for the farming system? And we understood like you know it's important and very difficult for farmers to have access to land because it's a problem. So if they are shift from their farming system to another approach, how is the government ready to help make sure like you know the, the, the farmers to shift to a new approach which is more sustainable to them? Thank you. Thank you. Was another question. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, you were talking about the, the diets, for instance, and the consumer part of the of the discussion. But I just want to to, to put this into <laughs> onto the table. Uh, we can change, for instance, some issues, some less less meat, more vegetables. I'm going to put an example: avocado. Avocado is a very interesting and trendy way to get nutrition and very good way for health, health healthy food, for instance. But for instance, avocado in Colombia, this is where I'm, I'm working, and is my research, is, provide, is producing a lot of social and environmental conflicts, degradation, and a, a lot of problems. And it's avocado. It's a, it's a very interesting food, uh, vegetable, that is good for health. And the, the country that we most export is to the Netherlands, for instance. Uh, my question is how to start thinking about diets, not only this very big picture of, OK, let's change meat for vegetables, but going more deeper in this kind of issues. OK, trendy foods, almonds, I don't know, avocado, whatever, in this big, big picture of the implication in other places, like Colombia, for instance. Oops. Well, I think the first question was partly already answered before, but I would uh, maybe connect it to the second. So what is the future of the livestock farming in the Netherlands if we take degrowth seriously? Um, who would like to answer that question? And I mean, also talking about the alternative to livestock farming and the implication of that alternative, of course. That's the second question. So um, how do we solve that puzzle? <laughs> well. I think the future is vegan. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, but we're not there yet. We're not. We're not. But with the avocados as well, because that's the question. Yeah, yeah. Of but the still, if you if you see how much uh, pollution avocado is uh, producing, then it's far less than livestock. So that we have to tackle first. feet so that's the biggest win winning part that we have uh, to change the system here towards a plant-based system and I think the Netherlands is a great example and a great experimenting uh, field to do that because we are the second exporter of meat and dairy in the world so if we if we are able to change it here then we are 
able to change it on a in a lot of places, I think. Mm. Um, yes, and the future is a more regional production. We were talking about the free trade agreements. I think we need to go regional. We need to not see uh, food as a commodity anymore, so more as a basis for our lives. And uh, that means also producing it uh, where it is most yeah, fruitful, uh, seasonal, fr uh, seasonal things. So it's regional and uh, not, not global, uh, it's uh, plant-based and not animals. And we talked about a lot of measures already to reach that. Thank you. Somebody else with feedback on this? Briefly, um, <laughs> I might be uh, causing some troubles here, but I'm not Why sure not? if the future is vegan. But uh, I think the fu future should be biodiverse. Um, and I think we, when we think about uh, the main drivers of uh, biodiversity loss is the production of monocultures. We have to change monocultures. The problem for avocado is not necessarily that avocados are like bad for the environment or it requires a lot of water. In Chile, it's the, case, the same case like as Colombia. But the problem is the scale of production. It's crazy. The same with soybeans, the same with livestock, actually. So if, you, if we think about a production of li livestock that is respectful to not only the environment, but also to the, to the animals and all, all of the beings that are uh, part of, of the ecosystem on, of the world, um, maybe we have to like, rethink our food systems to make them more biodiverse, including all the different types of, of, of uh, species. And that also will trigger a more biodiverse diet. Um, what one of the consequences of also um, monocultures has been the uh, homogenization of diets that has been causing many issues worldwide, health issues. Um, so I think biodiversity should be definitely tackled. Okay. Thank you. No, I, I agree with that. I also agree with everything uh, Christina said, except this part that we should all be vegan. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the Netherlands is a, a very extreme situation, right? Where we have an agriculture that is very highly dependent on uh, imported feed, which is causing a lot of trouble elsewhere. So here, definitely, we need to reduce uh, uh, animal uh, production. But there are also many, as um, Alessandra was saying, there are also, Mariana, sorry. <laughs> was saying there are also many uh, uh, sustainable animal uh, systems, right? There are agroforestry systems that integrate animals, there are silvopastoral pastoral systems, um, and for this we always have to look, um, and th there's also lands that are not so well suited for crop production, uh, which then are used by herder communities um, in a sustainable way. So I think we always have to look at what is locally there, and then also biodiversity is a very important uh, element. But uh, can I say, what is uh, an example of a, a system of production of animals that is respectful for the animal? Can you give me an example? Just to make it concrete, yeah, uh, for the vegans. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I can, I can uh, um, I, I, I heard someone who said avocados also. And uh, that made me think of a system uh, that, uh, that we visited in uh, Brazil. And it was an agroforestry system where actually they had avocado trees and other trees mixed with pigs. Right? And the pigs, they were free to herd, they, they were free to walk uh, in these fields. And they actually ate uh, the avocados. Their main feed was uh, avocado. So avocado and animal production and animal welfare, they all went kind of hand in hand there.